So welcome everyone. Uh, it is Wednesday, October 7th, 2015. This is the Aperio Teaching and Learning Call, and uh, I pasted in the agenda in the Etherpad. And the first thing we're going to do is, you know, project updates and announcements. And I pasted it in Jira the week. I don't know if anyone has any other suggestions, but I think this is actually an important Jira because it if we, we're thinking about releasing a 10.6, 10.5 is the latest community release, and if we did um, release a 10.6, this issue actually would, would be relevant to 10.6. Um, and so I think it's important people are aware of that. Uh, and then we have uh, Fred and Jesus from BlindSideNetworks.net. Uh, I'll be introducing, and they'll take, a, you know, uh, probably Fred said he'll probably take about 15 minutes or so to do a presentation and then open it up for questions, and then we can, uh, you know, discuss and schedule future meetings and themes and topics. So uh, I guess we'll go down the list here, and um, are there any project updates and announcements? Um, this is Wilma. I just have a quick pack <clears throat> Excuse me. A couple of quick announcements about the uh, virtual conference. Um, you just have one more week left to register if you want to get any of the promotional items. And actually, we're getting real close to the 200 cutoff. So if um, if you are interested in getting those promo items, you, you don't have much longer to, to get your name in. Um, you can continue to register after the 14th. So um, we will be taking registrations up until like the, right before the conference, um, but the promo item cutoff is coming up in a week. Also, there is the Sakai 11 skin contest that's um, kind of happening right now. You have until October 28th to get those um, submissions in, and the winners will be announced at the virtual conference. So um, if you're thinking about developing custom skin, um, you might want to go ahead and, and sign up to participate in the skin contest. Thanks, Wilma. Are there any other uh, contests or items of interest from the Sakai Virtual Conference that you want to mention? Um, we are going to be having a rogues gallery. Um, that's where everybody has a chance to um, design a page about themselves or their school or um, that sort of thing, all the attendees. So we'll be um, emailing out information on that um, about a week before the conference so people have some time to get in there ahead of time to set up their page. And we're actually going to be awarding um, gift certificates for the best pages. So there's going to be some giveaways associated with those. Oh, I see a question from Sawa about the promo items. Promo items for the conference are a t-shirt, um, it's a Sakai uh, virtual conference t-shirt, and um, a lunch coupon. Hey, thanks, Wilma. Are there any other uh, um, tricks? All right. Well, I'll mention uh, I'll mention a couple things. Uh, if anyone else can be thinking about ones they might want to mention, um, we are having a uh, Sakai camp um, that's sponsored by the PMC and the Perio. Um, it looks like it's going to be January 25th and 26th. Um, there'll be a public announcement soon. Working on a hotel, uh, so that's that's going to be. But it's a totally open meeting. So even though it's like a Sakai PD. Uh, generated event. It's totally open to anyone in the community, and we'll be talking about Sakai 11 and the status there and, and whatever needs to be done to get the release out, uh, and we'll all be discussing Sakai 12 and possibly even some discussions about beyond Sakai 12 and some experimental thinking around uh, where Sakai should go, um, and that's being led by uh, Dr. Chuck Severance, so that's keep a lookout for that, and that'll be in Orlando, Florida. And um, Let's see what else. Sakai 11. Um, uh, I think that we already announced that the uh, Gradebook NG is in our experimental nightly server. Um, the Gradebook NG team thinks they need about a couple of weeks more to um, work on a couple of different features in Gradebook NG before it goes into nightly uh, master. And then at that point, once Gradebook NG gets into Sakai, um, master and we have a chance to sort of kick the tires and, and see where it's at, then I expect the Sakai core team and the PMC will 
uh, then be talking about a freeze date for Sakai when code freezes. So that means we still don't have a code freeze. So if there's additional kind of uh, items that you're getting into Sakai, there still looks like there's time, you know, probably at least a month or so. Um, so uh, I think that's all I've got. Does anyone have any other announcements or questions? Okay. Super. Then we will. Uh, I'll introduce to Fred and Jesus uh, from I mentioned Blindside Networks, and I want to uh, do a special shout out to um, Blindside Networks because they are the ones that make Big Blue Button available to us and the recordings, and that's something that they uh, contribute to our community. And so I just want to say how much we really appreciate that and how big a um, uh, support that's been for all kinds of different meetings. So thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Blindside Networks, and I'll take it away. Thanks, Neil. So during this presentation, I like to wear my open source hat. So I'm Fred Dixon. I'm the product manager for Big Blue Button. I've been responsible for all the releases over the last 12, well, actually last seven years. Um, and Jesus Reduco is a software developer who works on Big Blue Button, and he also maintains the, the Sakai meeting tool. So if you have Good things to say about the product, give it to Jesus. If you have any feedback or criticism, you can give it to me. So I'm going to talk for probably about 15, 20 minutes. I have a few slides to go through. I, I always assume that people don't know about Big Blue Button. So the first little bit is just an overview of the project. And then we'll go into some details about what we've been working on, the Sakai integration, some stuff in the latest version. And this is all open source. So if you haven't been using Big Blue Button, you can set up your own server, and there's lots of good documentation on our website, and I have a link to it at the end. Okay, so in terms of online trends, there's about 4,500 degree granting institutions in North America, and about 25,000 secondary schools alone. And according to some stats, about 98% of them offer an online component. For anyone who's like in remote areas in the world, there's a huge social benefit for having the ability to, have to take an online course, both asynchronous and synchronous. In terms of educational software, there's lots of learning management systems. Many of them are proprietary. So unlike Sakai, many of them are commercial. There are many web conferencing systems as well. There are about 145 of them. And they're also, most of them are commercial. So when you look at open source solutions for web conferencing, well, what are the choices? And that's the market that we focus on. Our belief is Big Blue Button is that every student with a web browser should have access to a high quality online learning experience. And we intend to make that possible with Big Blue Button. So we as a Big Blue Button project focus on one market that is online learning. Big Blue Button started at a university, actually started in 2007 at Carleton University. You can tell it's a university because they use chalkboards, not whiteboards. The uh, use cases that we focus on are three one-to-one -one communication, so that it could be uh, tutoring, online coaching, virtual office hours. Uh, the other is small group collaboration, and where it's sort of people getting together, all sharing their webcams, or one-to-many. And we always say in the project, 50 users or less. However, there's no hard-coded number. We've seen sessions that are much larger. In terms of what's in the product, the, we have the core capabilities, desktop sharing, audio as you can hear me here, chat as you can see we're doing, uh, video, slides, and recently we added polling as well. In terms of the video, we try to make it very you know, interactive. Here's an example of four webcams being shared. Here's an example of nine webcams being shared. This is a great example if you're just getting together a group and you're collaborating. We do record and playback as well. So in the product, it will record all aspects of the session. So as I zoom in and zoom out, or I annotate or highlight, this will also be captured as well. For the techies in there, this is like an overview of the architecture. It's a Flash-based application on a client. I have to say very good things about Adobe. They did a good job of Flash on Mac, Unix, and PC. We are also working on an HTML5 client and native clients for iOS. And I'll talk about that in a few moments. In terms of the growth, we have a Facebook account. We have about 4,400 likes, Twitter account, about 2,600 followers, lots of good activity on GitHub where our code is hosted. And I always like to say that we, uh, it's all organic, no special preservatives. We didn't pay anybody to like us or follow us. This is just completely organic. 
Our developer mailing list has a very healthy growth and usage. So there's over 2,000 members now, and we usually see about 160, 170 posts a month on it. The product is localized. We use TransFX, and it's localized by the community. There's over 73 languages. I've sort of listed the top 90 the languages here that have about 90% or more localization. There's a good number of people in our community that as we release new versions, go in and update the localizations. And then we pull from TransFX so the client has the localizations. You can see it in the lower hand corner, the uh, localization pop-up, and you can see all the languages it supports. Every six months we get together with uh, the other developers around the world who work on BigBlueButton. There's a good concentration of developers in Porto Alegre, Brazil. A university there has made heavy use of BigBlueButton and contributed back to it, the MCOM project. So here we are last November down in Porto Alegre, Brazil. And here we are back in Ottawa six months later, the guys from Brazil come up and we work together for a week. We do sprints, we get lots of good stuff done. There are six core committers to BigBlueButton. And Richard is the lead architect. He is the one who started the project back in 2007 and has been working on it ever since. In terms of adoption, there's a couple of universities that make heavy use of us. This is a screenshot from one that you probably know quite well. They use it in one of their schools for online classes. Here's another one that I just did some Googling. We know these are our customers, so we uh, pulled some information off the website of them. There's another university, uh, it's not in the Sakai space, but I always like to point them out because uh, it's, it kind of speaks to our core. Uh, we're not marketers in the open source project. We don't stand up and say, hey, Big Blue Button is great. My philosophy and our philosophy is that we work really hard to make a product that we hope it solves a real problem, and then we see what other people say. So this was a quote from uh, Mariangi DeVille. Uh, we at National University College are very happy with our change to Big Blue Button. With our previous solution, we had over 50 support tickets a month after switching to BigBlueButton, that number dropped to six or seven. So from a product manager point of view, that is the quote to look for. We uh, were adopted over a proprietary product and they found it to be easier to use and that was measured in support tickets. And that's the goal is, you know, the product has to be used and has to kind of fade in the background to let the students and teachers get on the job learning. Uh, Laura, in terms of like a core developer, you can become a committer uh, in the Big Blue Button project. It's in our FAQ. Anybody can pull the code and improve it, but th that group of six people are the ones that kind of oversee what goes into Big Blue Button. Some open source projects will pull in updates for everybody because of the nature of Big Blue Button and it's real time. Some of us have telecommunication backgrounds. We treat Big Blue Button like a product release. And so a lot of scrutiny goes into the code, a lot of testing goes into the product. And we, because our goal is that in a long session, yeah, there, are no, there are no issues. And we have very high standards for each release. The product started in 2007 as well. It became open source. Uh, it was in development at Carleton University for over a year. And it, the first version, open source version, went up in 2009 on GitHub, or actually on Google Code. We're now on GitHub. Probably the biggest design win that we had, and a design win is when another project decides to build on top of yours, was the US Department of Defense. So earlier this year, the Defense Information Systems Agency expects to save at least $12 million a year with the rollout of a new system, Defense Collaboration Services, that they built on top of Big Blue Button. And you can see this article if you Google for DISA and Big Blue Button. So that is a huge design win. It's a huge deployment of Big Blue Button. Uh, they run many servers and they built it around our product. And I think part of it is just there is a very straightforward API for integration. This is what we use for Sakai as well. So these are the API calls that you have available if you want to integrate. So you think of Big Blue Button Server as, as the, the web conferencing side and the front end here in this case was a landing page, but it could be Sakai. It can be other systems and it, they use all these API calls. We try to keep it really simple to integrate. There are a number of LMS integrations. That is because we focus on the online learning space. And Sakai, very close to our heart. We've been working with the Sakai community over five years now. I think I was the first Sakai conference I went to was in Denver. In terms of the Sakai integration, you can see it there at the uh, Confluence website. Jesus Federico, he now maintains a Sakai integration and he took it over based on the work from Nuno Fernandez and Adrian Fish. They were the original developers. And Jesus has been maintaining the Sakai integration for 
over four years now. I'm just, you probably have seen it. I'll just give a highlight in terms of what, what's available in the Sakai integration. The instructor can create meetings. They can specify whether it's recorded, the duration appears in the calendar, what permissions there are. Uh, and the notifications will go to the calendar, and they can manage the recordings as well, publish, unpublish, and delete them. Our goal is to have a really deep integration so it was like a native Sakai experience when using the meeting tool. And a couple screenshots. When you go into the meetings tool, you can see uh, the meetings that you have, any past recordings. When you create a meeting, this is the screen. You can set the title, description, whether you want a recording, a duration, permissions, set dates in which students can enter and leave the meeting. And you can also do notifications as well. This was something recently that Jesus had added. When you join a meeting, you can have a button to join it here and you can see how many recordings and how many people are in it. You click, you join the meeting. And when you come back, uh, you can actually see the meeting. If you ever go back to the Sakai tool that's running, you can see it's running and you can end it. And you also have access to recordings as well. So you can see all the recordings from the past meetings. You can delete the recordings. So lots of cool stuff. The other thing that we've been working on in the last probably year off and on is the Paro OAE integration as well. I have a couple screenshots here. Sakai has been working, or Jesus. Uh, we've seen the developers in the last two conferences. Jesus has worked a lot on terms of trying to create a native integration with Sakai, or sorry, with the Paro OAE as well. So here's a screenshot of a meeting that's been created. And here we are in creating a meeting. So this is still a work in development, but we would love to get a really native, a nice native integration to Apparel OAE as it's a collaborative tool. Uh, yes, we do have an LTI support. So we are a certified LTI 1.0 and we maintain an LTI tool and it is there as part of the open source project. Um, actually, Neil, we like the integrations with Sakai. It provides a really nice experience because as great as LTI is, we can't do yet quite things like hook back into the calendar with LTI. So if you want to have your course, your, your meetings appear on the calendar, you have, a, you have to do a native integration. And we, we, we can do some things that are tighter as well. We do have LTI, but we invest a lot of effort into making sure that the Sakai integration is as best as we can make it. I'll give you a little bit over the roadmap. So we're currently in a beta for our 1.0. This was, this is, I think, our 14th release of Big Blue Button. And um, we did the uh, dev uh, for, we did the beta for 1.0 just recently, actually a couple of days ago on October 5th. So it's up on our website. You can download the latest builds and it has a couple of cool things in it, which I'll go over. Polling module, which I'll actually uh, demonstrate in a few moments. The improved video doc, which I showed a few screenshots of it. There's uh, emote icons or emojis. If you click the hand icon, you can give some feedback to the instructor in the class. Are you happy, indifferent, sad, confused, away from the keyboard? And this is also something that we did recently. Puffin browser is a cloud-based browser for mobile devices that you can run Flash applications on. So with Puffin recently in their 4.6, they support broadcast of microphone and webcam. So it means if you're on an iPad or an iOS device, if you're running the Puffin browser, you could participate in a Big Blue Button session. We're still building out HTML5 client and iOS client, but this was actually pretty cool. I definitely recommend checking it out if you have some students who are interested to connect remotely and they're on a mobile device. So the polling module was something that we spent a lot of time thinking about Again, thinking about how Big Blue Button would just fade in the background and let students and teachers get on with the job of learning. We noticed that a lot of slides are pretty much providing the context for a poll. So here's an example of like what color is not on my rainbow. I could poll and just say, well, what color do you think it is, A, B, or C? So to facilitate the instructor doing that really easily, i.e. easily defined as the minimum amount of effort so they could just flow with the presentation, as the, present, the presenter now, which I see on mine, has uh, a button next to the slide upload, which gives you some preset polls and the ability to do custom polls as well. So the presets here, I could choose A, B, or C, and this is what I would see. I would see live results 
as they came in. And so as the users respond, I can see how many users would be responding. And then at some point I can, I can publish it. And what the users would see is uh, A, B, or C. So yes, Laura, I will demonstrate in a few moments. I have some slides here with some questions. Uh, actually, I'll start with this one because this is pretty cool. So what color is not in the rainbow? So you should have heard a sound and there is going to be a choice at the bottom. And I have 11 people that have responded so far. Give it a moment or two more. Okay, so there's the results. So pretty good. So 13 uh, folks thought that it was the correct. Uh, a few others maybe just took a guess at it. One thing I can point out is that the white, the polling results are actually whiteboard results. So I can use the whiteboard tools to annotate, I can zoom in, zoom out, and I can clear them as well. This allows the instructor to do a poll, maybe use it as a part of their lesson, and then maybe do the poll again. And here's where, when I, when I saw the results, I just click publish and then it appeared in the slide and it will appear in the recording as well. The other thing we did was we, in the observation that the slides contain the context for a lot of discussion and for a poll, we already have the text of the slides in memory. We did that to support screen readers like JAWS on Windows. So in scanning the text, what we did is we had some simple logic to see if it looked like there were a bunch of multiple choices in the slide. And if there was, we'll put a single button here where the instructor can make one click to do a poll. So that'll allow them to go through a series of questions without having to do anything except click a single button. We call it smart polling. And we do the same thing. If we see the words true slash false or false slash true, we'll give you a button to just say, hey, is this true or false? And we'll do the same thing for yes, no. For the custom poll, you can put up to six choices and it will appear uh, instead of the ABC choices. And this way you can do off the cuff polls. You don't need to have any slide to do a poll. We're just showing how we try to integrate it in with the normal workflow of a presentation and make it easier for the instructor. And if you did a custom poll, the choices appear below. So we'll do another quick poll. So I have the number ABCD of the button here. I'll just do a quick. So let's try this one. Okay. You'll know if you when you use the polling, you'll notice that you'll see it's like 12 out of 23, 13 out of 23. The polling is anonymous. If you really want to know which students aren't responding to a poll, just ask everybody to raise their hand because the raise hand isn't anonymous. So I'll publish it. Most people got their exam the answer correct. Alaska. And this one I added for this presentation. So curious what your thoughts are. Mm, pretty hard to be Charles Hendrick. Mm, we got a few things for us. Okay. So clearly Lesson Builder is the, mo the Sakai tool that people like the most, which is nice. Okay, the video doc. Yes. I think I showed some screenshots of this already. Let me talk about the mobile. So we do want to provide a mobile experience. Uh, Flash has been really good for us. Again, lots of credit to Adobe. We have been, for, the, for a desktop laptop, the web client is great. We've been working on an HTML5 client, which has some screenshots for Android, and we're also working on an iOS client. The priority for us right now is the HTML5 client because it provides a path to progress away from Flash. But again, we're pragmatists. Flash has been working really well for us on the desktop but it also provides an option for Android as well. And I focus on Android because we're making use of WebRTC, which is the web real-time communication and Android supports it. This is the native ability for the browser to send and receive audio and video. Apple unfortunately prevents you and us from running any other browser on, the, on an iOS device. So you would have to write a native app to do it, which we are working on as well. There's a couple screenshots of the HTML5 client. This is taken from our website in terms of just the latest builds. This is what it looks like on the desktop. This is what it would look like in responsive. Here I've done portrait. If you did it landscape, it would show more of what it looks like in the desktop. And here it is full screen mode. So the idea is that you could be on a transit system, you whip out your Android device, you connect in through Sakai, you join the session, the HTML5 client launches, 
you put it full screen mode and you just follow the lecture. So this is work that we are working on. You'll see more released of it this fall, but we've been a lot of effort on the HTML5 client. And our focus of HTML5 client is really the student's experience. View the presentation, view the desktop sharing, two-way chat, two-way audio. And as we improve the HTML5 client through phases, we'll add presentation controls, two-way video, and moderator controls. And you can kind of see us adding more capabilities until it becomes parity with the Flash client. The future plans for Big Blue Button, there's lots of good things that are ahead. Closed captioning, we're working on that now. We've got some good feedback from some universities on how to do it. Breakout rooms, again, our customers looking for that in our community. Faster desktop sharing, you don't have to use Java to do desktop sharing because Firefox and Chrome do provide the ability to, to do it. But if you're using Safari or IE, you can always fall back to Flash or to Java. Full screen mode, shared whiteboard, synchronized video playback, shared notes. Uh, Pat, the HTML5 client to be completed. It's a good question. Um, I know the apparel community hits all its dates. Uh, we don't, we're not that good. We tend to not give dates with uh, Big Blue Button. We, our motto is we release on quality, not dates. So you will see as we come closer to a release, more information coming out about the HTML5 client, but you'll definitely see some of it this fall. And if any of you are at the OLC conference, uh, I'll show you firsthand the latest builds or the uh, Educause conference as well. We have a documentation website, lots of detailed, good information up there for administrators. Anybody wanting to set up Big Blue Button, use it. Of course, the Sakai integration, the meeting tool is all open source as well. At this point, happy to answer any questions you have about the project, Big Blue Button, anything that I've covered. I have a question, Fred. This is Neil. Sure. Uh, so far, the way that it, you know, I mentioned that the uh, the Big Blue Button and your hosting has worked really well for us. Um, I'm a little concerned about the password uh, thing uh, that we have just one password, essentially two passwords. Is that something we should be concerned about from a security perspective, um, or do you think as long as it's working okay, we we really just shouldn't worry about it? So the landing page that we set up for the apparel conference was like the absolute simplest landing page we could possibly create. So there's one password for the moderator and one password for the viewer. We could change those anytime. And we're also working on other ways that provide you a bit more fine grain. So I'd say just don't worry about it for now. Change the password as often as we like, as you like, and we perhaps will have something better for you in the future. Okay, cool. Hey, yep, yeah. so the, the polling is available now. So there's a link here to the announcement that we made on the release of 1.0 beta. And as I demonstrated it here, you're, the polling is live. We've been testing it for a couple of months. We tend to test the builds of our product on our demo server for about two months before we even reach beta. So a lot of testing goes into Big Blue Button. And it's available. Uh, you can, if you have a Big Blue Button server, you could update it to the latest build. <laughs> there are lots of options for uh, web conferencing. We do not focus, we, don't, we try not to compare ourselves directly with the others because they're not open source. We just focus on what we do and we do what the Big Blue Button Project does, is just focus on online learning. Cool, Dave. Other questions? So uh, Pat, it's a good question. How many videos will be supported? We have seen a session that had 21 webcams shared simultaneous. There's no hard cut of limit for the number of webcams. All that would happen is maybe things will start to slow down or the audio may go a bit crackly, but you can have as many as you want to try. And in students globally, um, actually, Dave, we don't use a content distribution network. The, all this is going from a single server. And if you, we know that people have set up servers all over the world. And 
we I've interacted with students and teachers from all over the world, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, Australia, I'm trying to think of all the remote places. And the internet has gotten really good over the last couple of years. And I must say the support for WebRTC audio in the browsers is pretty amazing as well. So uh, layoff for screen sharing, currently right now we use a Java applet. This allows us to share our screen and you say so you need to be able to run a Java applet. Chrome recently uh, stopped allowing uh, users to run applets. So we recommend Firefox. So the presenter and only the presenter needs to run uh, Java. All the other students would just see it as a video stream. If I start sharing my screen here, you can see I've got some slides open. I've just been working on the presentation before the call. And I have the ability to share a desktop as a presenter. And when I'm done, I can just close it and then it'll disappear. So no, with HTML5, if you're using Safari or IE, and those are pretty, sorry, Safari or, or, sorry, if you're using Firefox or Chrome, uh, we would be using WebRTC for the audio, the video, and the desktop sharing. So you would not need a Java plugin. So you can see, I keep emphasizing Firefox and Chrome. Safari and IE to date have not supported WebRTC, the web real-time communications, which enables a browser to send and receive audio and video. So this is where Flash actually does a pretty good job. We don't really care. You can use any browser and install the same Flash. But for an HTML5 client, you need to be able to send audio and video without a plugin. And that would mean you'd be using WebRTC and that would mean you'd be using Firefox and Chrome. Mm, yeah, so uh, the recordings you know, that we do, that we provide the Apparel Foundation, do not include chat in the video. So we made that decision where it just made sense to have a video file that had everything in it except the chat, because text is kind of hard to read in a, in, a, in, a web, in a video. Maybe we can change in the future, but yeah, we, <laughs> we, didn't, uh, we didn't try to put the chat in the video. I'd be interested if uh, I think a few people, folks, uh, whether said whether they use Big Blue Button or not. We've done a lot of work in this last release, especially with polling as well. So if you are using it or interested in using it, you can have one of the folks at your university or college just stand it up on a server, and you can easily connect with it. It's all open source. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, so Dave, uh, for companies that provide hosting, some of them will provide you a dial-in number as well. They provide hosting with uh, telephony integration as well. So Dave, some, again, some companies that provide you the integration when you go into a meeting, I think what you're trying to do is say, set up a dial-in number ahead of time. Um, I think you'll have to leave up to whomever provides the hosting and how they structured it, whether they can do that for you or not. You'll find that the built-in audio which is using Opus codec is like 48 kilohertz wideband audio. It's better than CD quality. And uh, again, I've spoken with people all around the world, Australia, and it's just, sometimes it's frightening how good it is. You just like you're right next to a person. And it depends a lot on the bandwidth and packet loss and are you on wireless and your microphone and so on. So I think anybody who's used Skype knows that Skype drops calls and Big blue button doesn't have any magic to put stuff over the pipes like anybody else. If you're teaching online, probably best to tell the students, hey, look, we're going to be on a three-hour class. If you get dropped, don't worry. Just refresh your browser, come back in. But by and large, 
the internet has gotten better and better over the years. And it's very viable to have students from around the world join into a class. Okay, so again, we're happy to answer any questions. Our email addresses are there. And uh, Neil, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Fred. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure everybody else does here. It was a uh, really helpful presentation. And good to know uh, kind of your roadmap and also uh, the reminder of the kind of the symbiotic uh, nature of the uh, open source and Big Blue Button and Sakai and other open source projects. So that's, that's pretty cool too. Um, I noticed that uh, we skipped or I skipped the Jira of the Week. So I'm wondering if people are okay. Uh, for uh, to go back to that on um, for a few minutes and take a look. Yeah, I thought the polling looked really cool too. Um, and I also tried out the little puffin thing on my Android while we were on there, and it worked. It worked well. It was pretty cool. Um, let's see the Jira that I wanted to uh, cover is SAK29622, and this one is um, pictures not showing after uploading with the profile tool. So if you all are familiar with the profile tool in Sakai, it has, in addition to a profile where you can put your image, it also has a pictures area. And um, the, the uh, pictures are not showing after uploading. And um, so that actually affects, I think, 10.5, and at the moment, there's no plans to upgrade it. In fact, we were thinking the, the thinking from the few people who have been discussing it is maybe the pictures tool is not really uh, used by the community, in which case uh, perhaps it's something we should just remove from, from the profile area. And that's why I thought it would be important to bring up because it's a loss of functionality, um, but it's a functionality we're thinking that maybe not too many people use. So I'm curious about your feedback. If you happen to know at your institution, do you use the profile tool? If you do use the profile tool, is the pictures tool? Because there's so many different picture sharing, ways of doing picture sharing um, out there now. And uh, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, Sakai is going to be a very popular option for that. So what do you guys think? Take a, take a few minutes, uh, look at the ticket, think about it, and I'm um, curious what your reactions are. So I see some coming in already. Uh, Laura Geckler says some students find it and put photos up. And Dave Evelyn said yes, which I'm guessing he's you're agreeing with me that maybe not too many people use it. Terry wrote, I'm glad if someone is uploading a profile pic only. So Laura, how do students uh, how would students feel? I don't know what version you're on, but how do students feel if if that uh, does it impact them? if uh, that's no longer there. Of course, there's the issue if they've already put photos up there, um, how they might get them back if the feature's not working. Are you, Dave is reading, okay. I'll be quiet then. They have copies more, I think I wrote, so okay. Dave, I'm not sure I understand your comment. I'm trying to make sure I get a good clue on understanding the JIRA. So it seems as though the basic premise is that, you know, when you add additional pictures into the profile area in the pictures area, that that's what's broken? Or is it that, because our use of the profile picture is actually very, very handy because we love the fact that that actually shows itself in the forum discussion. So you can actually make a, a tangible connection to the person that's actually in the in the discussion based on their profile picture. Um, yeah. But I don't necessarily, but, but if, if that is what is broken, then yes, we would definitely want the, the some image to accompany uh, that context in the forums. Um, but if it's, if, it's, if it's about the fact that there are lots of other pictures that seemingly don't work, then I don't care about that, but we do care about the, uh, we would care about the profile picture, yes. Right, the profile picture still works and Adam, I'm not sure if I pronounce your last name well. Uh, Waris 
uh, was correct. Um, it's not the it's the picture gallery part. So the profile picture works fine. Um, and Stephen Wicker, we used student uploaded pick in other places as well. Yeah. Terry writes, this will be a change in the goal of the profile tool to become a social media tool. But I think that the profile pick is a great addition. I'm just not sure it works as a social media tool. Yeah, I think that's right, Terry. I think that's kind of the thinking right now is that when profile was added, the thought was maybe that it would become more of a social media tool, which is why it has things like a link to Twitter, which um, still works. Uh, last I tested it, um, that it maybe become more of a social media tool within the institution. But I don't think that's something that's really taken off. Let's see, Dave said we'd like to do picks with LDAP. It's a bit cumbersome with our number of students. So I'm not hearing, just on this call, I'm not hearing a great deal of concern about that particular uh, functionality um, being missing or being removed. Right, I see, David, you made a qualifier about it's a bit cumbersome with the number of students for university provided picks rather than user provided. So any other, any other thoughts on that? Okay, well, listen, uh, you know, feel free to put a comment on the JIRA. Oh, I see Leah Bergman said we use a web service to pull in the picks. Um, I don't know if you guys, for a future agenda item, if anyone wants to do some sharing around how people uh, load uh, profile pictures into their system, that could be a potential uh, discussion item. But I'll just, um, let's see, I see that would be nice to know. How others put in the, prof the pictures? Laura, said, Laura Gickler says, yeah, I'd like to know, yes. So that could be a topic. For, it would be nice to have a volunteer for some institution that is loading in uh, university picks, one or two even. Okay, we can put that as one of the um, agenda items, one of the topics that we'd like to have in the future, see if uh, there's an institution or two out there that are doing this that might be uh, happy to share with the community. Um, so again, if, uh, I'll also post this to the list to make sure people are comfortable with it, but it sounds like the direction of removing that pictures feature probably will be okay. Um, so let's see. Moving on with the agenda. Uh, so um, now it's just discussing uh, future meeting topics. Um, we have our meetings through November 11th, which are down at the bottom there. Um, but are there any other topics? Let me take a look at any other topics we've talked about before that we also want to can Paste that in a second. I'm just gathering some of the other topics we've mentioned. Uh, There you go. Well, I see I have the action items on this one. So I don't want to paste those because then you all see I haven't done my action items here. So here's some additional items we had discussed that we wanted to wish list items. Um, for future discussion, lessons wish list, I'll add this one in about uh, loading in um, university pictures into Sakai profile. Um, lessons wish list, yours for Chuck Hedrick. Um, my favorite Jira, uh, Leap Phase 2, uh, Sakai podcasts and polls, most suggestion, third-party LTI tool demos, 
Um, I think I did put a call out to DevList for developer projects. I haven't heard any back so far, but I'll I'll maybe do that a couple more times or be on the lookout for developer options there. Um, I have not followed up on the, uh, uh, and I have checked with the Perio projects, and I'll be checking with them a bit more to get uh, them maybe to present some of the other Perio projects. Uh, Perio Fellows, I have not followed up on that one yet. So that's an action for me. Are there any other topics that either folks would volunteer to lead um, or that uh, you would like to see? Okay, well, uh, my action for all of you is to uh, think about, you know, topics that you'd like. This, this is your meeting, and so think about the topics that you would like to see being discussed in the teaching and learning group, whether it's at Sakai level or an Aperio level, and uh, feel free to share those ideas with me, Tricia, uh, Gordon, or Matthew Burgess so that we can, um, you know, add them to the agenda and find a slot for them. <coughs> And if there's no other, if there's are there any other announcements or questions or issues? If there's not, I'll give it a couple seconds. If there's not, then I uh, suggest we'll just uh, end the meeting a few minutes early. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll catch you next time. I'm going to close up the meeting in just a moment.